This episode is sponsored by Audible. Black holes are the most terrifying and destructive things in the universe, so they would make truly dreadful weapons. Or would they? So today we are returning to the topic of black holes. In our previous discussion in black hole ships and colonizing black holes, we challenged the notion that they are only good for destruction and showed how they could make for amazing spaceships to rapidly take us out to explore new worlds and how they could help us build and power new worlds. Yet while they have great value in those regards, they are indeed capable of immense destruction. A weapon can be used for good, not just ill, and as usual, we'll mostly bypass the ethical aspects of the technology under discussion, but we will note some valuable defensive roles they might play, and also some adaptations of the basic technology that might make them even better if we ever truly master gravity manipulation. In those previous episodes on black holes as ship drives and power sources, we focused on black holes of sizes that occur in nature. But today we'll be looking at the entire range, from the tiny artificial Kugelblitz variety that emits lots of Hawking radiation, to monsters far more massive than anything that exists in nature, as far as we know. We have essentially two different types of black holes of note. The first is the more massive kind, be it the natural ones made from dying stars, or more artificial ones likely made by artificial implosion or ultra-relativistic collisions. These are dark creatures able to rend apart any who venture too close to them, and which can emit impressive amounts of energy not from themselves but from the radiation of things falling into them that have heated up immensely from friction while spiraling inward, but not crossed over the event horizon of that black hole. The other variety are those much smaller, which we usually call a Kugelblitz black hole due to how we envision making these objects tinier than an atom. That comes from the German word for ball lightning, and is doubly appropriate as we expect these objects to glow brightly. Black holes slowly give off energy as they evaporate, and the smaller they are, the faster they evaporate. One that's evaporated to a tenth its prior mass will give off a hundred times the power and will have only a thousandth of its life remaining. It will also have an event horizon merely a tenth its original size. A bit later it might be a thousandth its original mass, radiating a million times more brightly and with only a billionth of its life remaining, with an event horizon a thousandth what it used to be. Needless to say, that starts sounding a lot like a bomb, and a black hole of just one ton of total mass would glow as brightly as our sun does, though only for a few millionths of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second. In that short instant it will radiate 9 times 10 to the 19th joules of energy, the equivalent of 22,000 megaton atomic warheads, or 1.4 million Hiroshima bombs, and that one ton explosive is so tiny, just 3 trillionths of a trillionth of a meter across, that if we sat it next to an atomic nucleus, it would be to that nucleus what a marble is to our planet. This means if you shot one at a planet, ignoring that it would not live long enough to go through, it would fly right through that planet with no effect besides the energy it was giving off. Micro black holes are the ultimate in armor penetration. There is no material we know of that can stop this micro black hole from penetrating through, except another black hole. That's an important point because the most typical use of black holes as a weapon in fiction is to dump them into someone's planet so it gobbles it up. This is not going to work. Oh, a full solar mass black hole would rip that planet apart, but that's decidedly overkill. Your typical natural black hole is at least a million times more massive than our planet, and the energy needed to hurl it at a planet could be far more easily employed to just hurl something smaller and faster at one instead. It's far easier to blow up a house with a few kilos of explosives than to drop a mountain on it. The solar mass black hole approach is the classic case of swatting a fly with a star-sized sledgehammer. You don't win wars that way, because if your advantage in energy is that overwhelming, you probably didn't even view its use as a war. If this is not easy for you to do, 
then you are going to lose if you deploy attacks that are pointless overkill when your equally armed enemy is being more tactical with their expenditures. That is the first rule of warfare after all, don't waste ammunition, you might need it later. Of course the nice thing about black holes is that as very massive objects go, they are pretty stealthy, and it is nice if your enemy doesn't know you're there until the bullet arrives to introduce you to them, but it's still not a reason for pointless overkill, snipers don't sneak up and shoot people with bazookas. A less massive black hole, say the mass of a large asteroid, might seem ideal. We know what a large asteroid can do to a planet, just ask the dinosaurs, and one massing a trillion tons is going to ruin your whole day, or epoch, when it hits. But of course, they are awful weapons against a spacefaring civilization. As we've noted before, a spacefaring civilization that detects an asteroid coming doesn't have people running around their observatories in a panic, rather their people are running around in joy at this sudden injection of cheap metals into that market as they plan to deflect and capture it. For attacking spacefaring civilizations, what you want is a weapon that carries enough force to do the job, moves quite fast, and hits the target. That is the first rule of warfare after all, shoot first and don't miss, and don't use a squirt gun, since there's precious little point in getting the first hit if all it does is irritate them. In this regard, a black hole with the mass of such an asteroid works fairly well. They won't see it nearly as soon as they would that asteroid, and even better, you could use one smaller but faster, carrying the same amount of kinetic energy. In this case such a black hole emits very little, a trillion ton black hole only emits a few hundred watts of Hawking radiation and an order of magnitude more than the typical light bulb, though in the hard x-ray range of the spectrum in this case, and would not explode for a couple billion trillion years so the kinetic energy it carries is the thing we'll exploit, plus the notion it would suck that planet apart when it hits. A black hole of this large mass is much smaller than an atom, so the defenders will have problems pushing on it, and yes it can be deflected off course by shoving on it, the same as anything else. Though it's rather hard to focus enough force on a fast moving object, smaller than an atom, that has all the momentum of a trillion ton object. So it sounds like a great weapon, except it's going to fly right through that planet, doing basically no damage. It could slam right into the middle of a football field, and most of the folks sitting in the bleachers would just feel yanked on strongly for the fraction of a second it passed by before sliding through the planet. It's massive enough that if it passed through your house, you'd probably get bones broken, and those x-rays it was giving off would be handy for letting you know which ones. It would then pass through the planet and out the other side and off into the void. Indeed, even if you made one here on Earth, it would just drop down and pop back out on the other side and fall back, oscillating around the planet. So if you want to get a black hole lodged in your planet, you need it to arrive with virtually no velocity. It's not going to be slowed in any noticeable way by the atmosphere or the planet, and would have picked up speed as it approached, same as any falling object. Ramming through thousands of kilometers of rock would slow most things down, but remember, this is a trillion tons of material with a cross-section smaller than an atom. The handful of particles it might absorb passing through will slow it down no more than hitting a sheet of tissue paper would slow down a large asteroid. Who knows, our planet could already have had close contact with thousands of these black holes slamming rapidly through it in its history we still haven't ruled out primordial black holes existing. We wouldn't really know about it because they wouldn't be sufficiently destructive for us to worry about it and then they'd be gone. So it's actually very hard to damage something by just hitting it with a modestly massive micro black hole, even one slow enough to repeatedly pass through a planet and slowly gain mass, and it will gain it faster and faster as its event horizon widens and its oscillation rate slows. But don't hold your breath waiting for the apocalypse, as it would take it many trillions of years to gobble up the planet. Professor Christopher Springob once calculated a billion ton black hole would need 10 to the 28th years to eat Earth, 10,000 trillion trillion years of oscillating around inside our planet, and since it would be giving off a few hundred megawatts of gamma radiation while it did this, it would not live long enough to eat the planet and would obviously not be very stealthy. 
an attack over this time frame is meaningless anyway, as the Sun would have long turned into a cool, stellar cinder. Even the solar extension techniques we discussed in Civilizations at the End of Time can't prolong a star that long. That's exactly why that series contemplates using black holes for survival, and such being the case, your attack was merely doing them a favor, akin to throwing an asteroid at a planet. That violates the first rule of warfare, don't give gifts to your enemies, and doesn't even get the Trojan Horse caveat, since while it is easy to hide your troops inside a black hole, you can't deploy them from there, except as hawking radiation. Incidentally, if you're wondering why the trillion ton one was giving off x-rays and the billion ton one was giving off gamma, Hawking radiation comes out at various wavelengths, with a peak photon energy or frequency linear to mass or a wavelength inverse to it. If you wanted one that glowed in the visible light spectrum, it would need to be about 20,000 trillion tons, and wouldn't make a very good light bulb since it would give off about a microwatt of light. This one could actually eat a planet in a respectable time and would live far, far longer though would still take a very long time to do so, particularly as its gravity is now strong enough to have quite a heating effect on matter falling into it. It's hard to suck matter into a tiny hole if it's turning into super hot plasma. It won't even eat the planet, but it will blow it up. You still can't shoot it at a planet, as it would fly through. We finally have an example of something that causes some real damage along its passage, But if left inside the planet for any decent period of time, it will form an accretion disk, and that will blow the planet up. You've essentially ignited a small star around that black hole, and indeed if you've seen our Making Suns episode, you know this is one of our tricks for creating artificial stars, though there we use far less mass. We keep it inside a shell so that the plasma can't escape probably made of tungsten or similar so the shell can be hot enough to emit light itself without melting. That brings us to magnetic containment. A black hole as a weapon would need to be stealthy on its approach, since it needs to come in slow and that is a lot of mass and space isn't really empty, so it will encounter gas as it approaches and start radiating. If you make an artificial black hole that's rotating, you could also use that magnetic field it would have to steer it though that won't be stealthy. You still need to exert a lot of force to move it, and that will be decidedly detectable. And again, it needs to be going slow, on an order of the speeds planets generally orbit at, tens of kilometers a second, so shooting it from another system would require tens of thousands of years to arrive, and the launch itself is unlikely to be subtle. You need to expend around a trillion, trillion joules of energy to push it up to that speed, even ignoring the energy needed to make it in the first place, and that's on par with all the sunlight hitting the Earth for months, so any civilization you're likely to need to deploy this against probably could see you creating and launching it. They also can have early detection systems out to spot one, even if just by its gravity, that will have a fairly detectable effect with sensitive enough gear, and at those speeds, a detection grid out in the Oort Cloud would pick it up millennia before it arrived. With such timelines, even if you can't knock it off course, you could move even your own planets out of the strike vector. These problems make it seem like these aren't very good weapons. You can't even make one on a planet since people are going to notice you stuffing a mountain range worth of material into something. However, they are a good way to sabotage a planet someone else is planning to colonize, since you could calculate the right sized one to act like a bomb on a timer to blow the planet up, or keep one in a cage to be triggered to go off. You could do this on a gas giant for an even bigger boom, or a sun too, though that would be much harder to keep caged and stars are already super hot balls of plasma. But if you put one in a star it will cause a nova, though hardly instantly, and you do still have to shoot it in fairly slow. And if it's not big enough, no boom, at least not for a very long time. If that cage is holding onto the black hole magnetically, you might be able to use that to slow the whole thing down faster, but trillions of tons of matter that you also can't physically touch isn't easy to push along quickly. Timed right though, or in a cage rigged to detonate on a timer or command, this makes an amazing ambush method, 
but at the very least it also allows you to engage in resource denial, destroying valuable assets so your enemy can't use them, temporarily anyway. As we noted in Colonizing Black Holes, they are very valuable real estate if you've got the right technology, and obviously you do if you're using this method, and that means your enemy probably does too since otherwise you'd be corp stopping them by the sheer energy advantage. That's one way to weaponize them too, just use the power generation methods we discussed in the prior episodes to power conventional weapons, or conventional weapon manufacturing facilities, or use them as ship drives on unmanned vessels. As we often note here, there is no such thing as an unarmed spaceship, because the velocities and energies involved are so high you can devastate someone just by ramming your ship into them. A black hole ship rammed into a planet is still going to see the black hole part fly out the other side, but the big relativistic ship it used to be in is going to slam that planet more powerfully than if it was made out of atomic bombs. The need to make that ship huge to control the black hole is also likely to make the asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs look like a pebble in comparison. It's a relativistic kill missile powered by a black hole, but it can move very fast. The first rule of warfare is to shoot first, but that assumes your bullet is getting there first. A preemptive strike that takes forever to arrive is at worst wasted and at best is just a way to take the other guy with you, which admittedly is handy for more than vengeance since it permits the mutually assured destruction strategy. Needless to say, such black holes also make for awesome landmines. If you built one into an asteroid or comet, cage, and had sensors and remotes on it, you could get quite the bang by letting the cage fail. It is all that's holding back the matter above. You're going to get a bang releasing a fail percentage of the mass energy of that object. We talked about using these asteroid mass black holes as centers of habitats, where they can provide both gravity and power, so if you've got them you can easily colonize all those countless small icy bodies in the Oort Clouds we think most stars would have. If those served as early warning and defense sites, they'd have a lot of power to run detection and weapons, and have a heck of a self-destruct mechanism too. Space is big and empty, especially out so far from a star, but it's not that big or that empty. You set off a miniature nova and it's got quite a blast radius, even by the standards of interstellar voids. Of course if you've got a big natural black hole, you might not care if the enemy sees it coming, and you can move it very fast, using the Quasar Drive method we discussed in Fleet of Stars. And that's going to wreck any system it passes through. It's one attack, even a full-blown Kardashev II civilization with a Dyson Swarm is going to have to work hard to defeat, as it's carrying more mass than a normal solar system and is a big engine. There's no subtlety there, everyone in the galaxy is going to know you just lit one off, and since it's going to keep on trucking, you basically declared war on every system in the galaxy that is within several light years of the path of destruction it's following. You could scale that up for deployment too, but there is one thing a black hole can't pass through, another black hole. So if you shot one at another black hole, when it hits and they merge, it's going to be very devastating. The energy release from a binary black hole merger in Ring Down makes a supernova look like a firecracker. Ring Down occurs when two black holes merge and begin to settle down to a stable form, where any distortion in the shape is dissipated as gravitational waves. In the final fraction of a second the black holes can reach extremely high velocity, and the gravitational wave amplitude reaches its peak. That sounds pedestrian until we look at an example. The large black hole pair GW150914 that LIGO picked up, each about 30 times more massive than our Sun, released so much energy in ring down that if it produced visible light we could detect, even though it was a billion light years away, it would have outshone our own full moon. It would literally have been brighter than all the light sources in the observable universe combined. Of course that's also another way to weaponize smaller ones, which would normally fly right through a target, if you can precisely aim to intercept close enough to hit or ring down. 
so you could shoot two from opposite directions to collide at the center of a target, where the merged black hole would now sit stationary, then you could send them in as fast as you want and quite stealthy, though that takes some precision targeting, and if you can pull that off, you could probably also send two that were coming from roughly the same direction that would intersect close enough to ring down, and that released gravity wave is going to be pretty nasty even though the merged black hole will still fly out. Precision like that also strongly implies you've got the ability to make Kugelblitz black holes, and keep them fed too. Kugelblitzes are so small they're very hard to feed and don't live long, and the general notion of making one on a ship and shooting it at another ship while appealing wouldn't generally be a good approach. You're cramming a huge amount of focused energy into making one, instead of just shooting that same precision energy at the enemy target, and a lot of the energy will be lost en route to that target. A black hole is less a bomb than a big flail that burns brighter and brighter before dying off, and space being space, any such piece of ordnance is spending far more time crossing through areas where its radiation isn't doing much damage than near or in an enemy ship. You'd probably get more mileage if you just had a directed vent on the black hole you're probably powering your ship with, with some magnetic nozzle that lets you spray matter in as an accretion disk and blow that out as a beam at your enemy. However, if you can keep them fed, especially if you can refeed them their own energy by reflecting it back in, which would require gamma ray meals that we don't know how to make at the moment, then you've got bombs you can make in advance and store to fire at will, and potentially keep them caged while they fly to the target, so you could use very short-lived ones, fired at relativistic velocities in cages, that would smash against an armored hull, and the black hole would slide right inside and evaporate, like a tank round and sabo, and we'll just call that a black hole sabo round. These would also be rather delicate devices, and effectively as dangerous as making and storing antimatter munitions, which you probably can do if you can make these too. Both have advantages and disadvantages. A black hole sabo is the ultimate in armor penetration, since it will go right through the hull, while antimatter munitions get double the yield, since it's setting off an equal mass of normal matter, presumably the enemy ship's hull. The shared disadvantage is the whole own goal problem, where you get blown up by your own bomb, which violates the first rule of warfare, don't use weapons more likely to kill you than your enemy. So the Black Horse Sabo is physically possible if dangerous, and would require some insane precision to make and store those Black Horse Sabos, not to mention a perfect Gamma Ray meal, and I mean a perfect, 100% reflective one, and as I said, we have no Gamma Ray meals at all. If you've got those, you do still have another way to make a black hole bomb, using the super radiance method discussed in Kurzgesagt's black hole bomb episode. That's a very good episode and explains it in more detail, so you can get the details there, but short form, you get super radiant scattering of energies near a black hole, and if you're reflecting that back rather than letting it out, it's going to exponentially grow as it bounces around and eventually explode. This trick works on any decently sized black hole and is another way to use smaller artificial ones as landmines, but does need those gamma ray mirrors. Other types of non kugelblitz black hole power generation would usually only need something reflected to X-rays, and we can reflect those, gold and iridium foils are good for that, but if you're just reflecting it back and forth to build up, that will shift up to gamma. It also requires precision reflection, so it isn't something you'd use as a final self-destruct when you were losing a battle. Again though, we don't have gamma ray meals, and may never get them. Gamma is so dangerous precisely because those are high energy photons that don't play nice when they slam into matter, meals included. We never know what technologies might develop though, and since I'm actually writing this episode way back in April, the same day our Clark Tech Anti-Gravity episode came out, it's worth reminding that if you can engage in gravity manipulation, using some physics beyond our current understanding, you could also potentially make some amazing defensive shields this way too. 
A black hole's event horizon is one heck of a protective barrier, but the problem is it takes a lot of mass to make one that's not microscopic. If you could play with that in some way to make bigger event horizons without needing tons of mass, or make them flat rather than spherical, you might be able to deploy what amounts to the ultimate shield. Of course black holes have event horizons linear to their mass, so if we're talking about K3 civilizations, galactic empires, worried about enemy galaxies firing high energy beams their way, they might consider cramming a supermassive black hole together on a vector directly between you and them, especially if you've compacted your own galaxy down using the methods we discussed in Fleet of Stars so you didn't need as much coverage. It's easier though to live near a giant black hole and just keep on the other side of it from your presumed enemy. However, and this is a note for anyone living around black holes, even smaller ones, it's hard to get a black hole to really hit things rather than slide through them unless those things are also black holes. That still takes some impressive aim, for the small ones anyway, where you are trying to hit something atom-sized or smaller inside a facility that obscures your view, but the really big ones are obviously pretty easy to aim at, and as we mentioned earlier, black hole modules are nothing you want to be near when they happen. There's many other ways to use them, Some of course would be less effective than other weapon types, and others are more secondary. For instance, as mentioned in other episodes, normal black holes are a very good way to change the direction of a spaceship significantly and cheaply, so a fleet engaged in century-long interstellar conflict could use one to come at an enemy from an unexpected angle by swinging around one and coming out at an unpredictable vector. Since they are so valuable and so easy to make a giant explosion by ramming matter into them, you might booby trap them knowing an enemy would be very likely to swing close to them. Fundamentally though, they offer such a great value economically and strategically if you've got the tech to use them that they'd seriously alter what the goals and objectives of conflict were about. These objects so feared in science fiction that people avoid taking their ships anywhere near them instead become super valuable strategic resources. But as we saw today, they can be rather dangerous to you, not just in enemy hands, but in your own. As mentioned, there's a lot of black holes in science fiction, but very often those black holes have very little in common with actual science, though we do have a fair few sci-fi authors who are scientists and do it right. One of the best of these is David Brin, who got his degrees and doctorate in physics and space science and always has accurate science incorporated into his work. We've recommended his books before, most notably his Uplift series in our episode on Uplifting, but one of his other best known books is Earth, which features an artificial black hole getting lost on the planet and seems a good choice for Audible Book of the Month and for our short series on black holes. Written back in 1990, it's also considered one of the best for having predicted a lot of technology that came afterwards, and Bryn not only always combines a mix of excellent storytelling with good hard science, but is great at seeing consequences and shifts that technologies are likely to cause in society. He is one of the best hard sci-fi authors, and long overdue to win our book of the month, and you can pick up a free copy of Earth by using my link in this episode's description, audible.com slash Isaac, or text Isaac to 500-500. Audible offers a 30-day free trial, but each month you're a member, you now get a free audiobook and two Audible Originals, and those credits roll over to the next month or year and stay yours, along with any books you get even if you later discontinue your membership. And with their convenient app, You can listen on any of your devices and seamlessly pick up where you left off, whether you're listening at home, commuting, running errands, or off jogging or at the gym. Audible makes it cheap and easy to access a vast collection of amazing stories. Incidentally, if you're interested in what other books have won our Book of the Month, we have a fairly comprehensive list of not only them but most of the other books we've recommended over on our website, IsaacArthur.net.
As we were mentioning, it's fairly common for a lot of science fiction to take liberties with science, and one of the most common examples are comic book superpowers. Next week we'll be taking a look at a lot of those and asking if technology might let us create or closely imitate such abilities, as well as considering a lot of overlooked options such abilities would offer. The week after that we'll head back to the Upward Bound series to look at how energy beaming technology might allow very cheap and safe transport from ground to orbit. For alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the notifications bell, and if you enjoyed this episode, hit the like button and share it with others. Until next time, thanks for watching and have a great week.